this is there's so much information here. I think we yeah. need to we need to um, put it all into context if you don't mind. So the so we have uh, we have the demolition of the Metropolitan Building starting in December of 1961 and, mm -hmm. and completed in 1962. And obviously that had brought up uh, a, a a very small preservation movement at the time, but it really ended up birthing the modern preservation movement in not only Minneapolis but in the state of Minnesota because the the city realized that that it um, through this survey it had resources that were valuable and could be reused uh, that were part of this vision for 19, 1985 and coming out of that there was legislation introduced to uh, to really initiate what are called Heritage Preservation Commissions in Minneapolis, and that's the legislation you're mentioning here. So, so could you tell us? So, this um, the testimony that you provided at the legislature in 1971 was related to that Heritage Preservation Commission language. What what was the background conversation in, at the city of Minneapolis leading up to that? Did they see the recognition for a municipal commission like the Committee on Urban Environment that would provide some kind of guidance to the city in this in this area of historic preservation? Well, actually, those here are still pretty lonely. Um, I was the only one to testify. Uh, the one was, sole preservationist yeah, testifying. Yeah, I was with my uh, associate when they were together. Uh, and it was uh, lucky uh, that we were able to speak. Uh, they could persuade them to, 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 to get it through. And uh, I must say, you know, that all these other things follow, come later. I mean, the fact today, you know, some 56 uh, cities right, in the here, state, preservation state has given Heritage Preservation Commission, right. which is uh, wonderful. And uh, personally, this work here prepared me to do other things all around the country, around the world. And, you know, I haven't, after my work here, I, I was offered a job in Dallas. Uh, to my surprise, I again got involved, and I was one of the things at that time was to save or not to save Texas School Book Depository. Mm -hmm. Where the, where the that, Lee Harvey Oswald the, is supposedly positioned, the, or allegedly, I guess. Right, <laughs> yes. right. Um, that killed uh, President Kennedy. And there were some different perspectives. Uh, some, when we went to the state to have try to have it preserved, Another group follow us, one have it demolished to wipe out from memory, so to speak. Mm -hmm. How can you, I mean, this, so we fought, and we, we took, took two and a half years at 90 some meeting in the last year, and to get it through, mm -hmm. and were able to save it, and develop the whole area, 50 some acres, called West End District. And that is now, you know, it's in, in the National Trust book that I mentioned all the process complicated. So that's sort of what I learned actually I was able to help. Uh, so you learned that out of working from here in here Minneapolis. And then prepare me for that. And I should mention that the, I mean, the community and urban environment still continues its its work on uh, really talking about the the benefit of place making in the environment, the uh, the role of, of culture, including arts and, and music yes. and preservation in uh, in our urban experience. Um, the, yes. The Heritage Preservation Commission, if I can mention, I'm going to I'm going to assume that some of our viewers have never heard of it. HPC, Heritage Preservation no. Commission, it's a it's a municipally appointed body that advises the city council on matters con, uh, concerning historic properties in their cities. Um, there are different levels of Heritage Preservation Commissions. We may just mention that there are over uh, over 56 of these. There, uh, the commissions are uh, made possible by this enabling legislation that we may mentioned. The uh, state of Minnesota made the enabling legislation for cities to enact preservation ordinances. Right. So much like a zoning ordinance, uh, preservation is considered an overlay. So in planning terms, right. it's an overlay zoning for allowing decisions to be made right. based on set parameters and criteria. Uh, we know them as uh, design guidelines um, or sometimes using the Secretary of the Interior standards to make design decisions for historic properties that come for permits. Exactly, and not only preserve uh, what, what is significant, 
heritage of a city, of a community, uh, but also make sure the new blend with the old is so compatible, so to speak. And I think you could work at it beautifully, you can continue to build, let's say, not just preventing. You, if it's done properly, you, you know, you have a way of continuing to grow and make it grow. And uh, I think this, this is what really takes, this is what the community can be benefit from. Um, I think in the past two decades, I worked, before I retired, I worked in, uh, in Lower Town. In Lower Town in St. Paul, the Lower Town yeah. Historic District, there, yes. You know, there you are, you know, there's another test and challenge. But however, we want to make sure new and blend with the old and all these mm -hmm. different challenges in each case. Well, that's an excellent question about the how you know, how history fits in with the, with really, with city building, so to speak, and how did histor this historic property, the, this, this place that was, was truly beautiful and significant to people, uh, the Metropolitan Building, um, fit in with the much larger, both planning and economic development uh, movement that was known as urban renewal, which took place from really the late 1950s through the mid 1970s in cities all across the United States. So, what what was the conversation about the remaking of Minneapolis at the time? I think the urban renewal really taught the city leaders and planners some new lesson at that time. And I, even though originally the motivation was try to clean up the blighted area or improve people's lives or whatever. But it ended up with not necessarily seceded. In many cases, displaced people and, you know, and, and small business and so forth. Because and it demolished. Demolishing. And large also when you're rebuilding it, and the, some of the development turned to be more gentrification. Mm -hmm. Never let the poor just come back, but just displacing it. And so, gentr gentrification as a term, terminology, yeah, just means... Displacement right. of the poor and only for the rich to come back for higher income. Mm -hmm. I think that we, we realized that was a mistake. And so we changed the national policy and uh, all the things that try to learn how you can do uh, renewal, but at the same time still protect the social fabrics protect the heritage of a community. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what is our, uh, the lesson we learned from those years. So as, the, as a lead planner then at the city of Minneapolis, when you were developing the, the plan for 1985 that you mentioned, yeah. trying to factor 20 years into the future, did the you know, did this, this demolition of the Metropolitan Building and other uh, properties, I mean, largely where we're located here in the city uh, was, is on the edge of what was called the Gateway District. And that was largely the um, historic, uh, historic properties right along the riverfront and, and back from that uh, to Washington Avenue, uh, which had become very economically depressed, but still had an, a very good building stock, so to speak, which was which was really leveled entirely right. for the buildings we see today, which, in curious uh, curious twist of fate, now are very eligible as historic properties because they're they are mid-century modern. So, historic preservation is really about coming around. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It it really has changed so much. I think that the when we started doing the Metro Center 85, this was a wonderful time in some way. We have a very distinguished leader in the city and also have in the community, the community. this was when the Dayton families were very active mm -hmm. in the downtown. And we have Tommy Thompson, the city design, the city coordinator, was very progressive. And uh, anyway, Dayton Company was so engaged and this is the period we began to build Nicola Mall, mm -hmm. Skyway, and French parking. This is the time in the Metro Center 85 we proposed to move the orchestra hall to downtown rather than in, 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 in university. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and because that facility was inadequate. So these were all done one after another mm -hmm. and they really began to change, uh, have chance of. Of course, today, as I see it, you go to North Loops and other, or you, you see so many uh, warehouses being renewed. Mm -hmm. 
and I, this really heartens me, and uh, it, it's so uh, happy to see that people, these fine buildings are saved and become great places for people to live, to work. A lot of creative industries are there, and the people, when I call the cyber villagers, mm -hmm. and work on the internet and other, are there, and uh, they are very creative, graphic designer, architects, and advertiser, all kinds of people. So I think that uh, that's a very exciting thing is, is happening. So what would you say needs to be present for the, the larger preservation movement to be successful based on your experience? Well, I've been reflecting about my own experience here and there around the country, around the world. I think that I actually am writing a book about urban mm. rejuvenation. Get it? Yeah. You got it here yeah. first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's talking about the need to envision a, a new future. The need to know how to make people believe what you believe. Mm -hmm. So marketing. The need, the need to actually find a way to put the finance together. Mm -hmm. The need to cut through the, the public-private partnership. And sometimes it's not collaboration, it's more competition. Mm -hmm. And how do you make sure it come together? And, and the need to have good leader and good resources and all these different things. Then, and with the expertise of interdisciplinary expertise, design, you know, you know market, mm -hmm. and all those things, preservation knowledge, all those things, then I think you could, you could really make a difference. I think the lower town started empty warehouse, mm -hmm. a parking lot could be all demolished, and, uh, just like here. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't. And, uh, and we were able to save every building uh, in that district except two. One was burned down, the other one, uh, even though with a lot of effort, it just couldn't be saved. Uh, anyway, today we actually rehab 3.3 million square feet of warehouse space. In, the lo in, lower, in lower Town, town alone. Yeah. That equivalent to three IDS three towers. Three IDS towers in uh, historic preservation. Yeah, if we demolish all that, it would take something like two or three thousand boxcars to ship all the, the material away and to dump them to junkyard, but junkyard is already full. And so you, you know, you, that really makes a difference. And you can see now the people living there, 5,000 people living there, 12,000 people working there. 500 or 700 artists, instead of being displayed, being actually, uh, you know, living there, working there, and uh, and not only that, high tech also moved in, mm -hmm. and uh, just uh, including Cray Research, mm -hmm. just moved in, and put Gautier Tower to something like 93 percent occupied, which is higher than most of the downtown tower. I would think that give us some lesson, uh, perhaps. Conservation could create jobs, could produce a, 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 a kind of community that everyone can enjoy. And even in this difficult time, there are two housing, new housing projects being built in Lower, in lower Town. town. So, so that tells you the difference, I think. 